What are agencies looking for in a freelance translator? This first part of my presentation is about what a client, especially a translation agency, wants in a freelance translator. Much of it will also apply to interpreters. I had a one-man freelance translation and interpretation business for several years in which uh, my clients included individuals, other companies, and translation agencies before I started the gradual transition to running my own agency. It began with me giving suggestions to potential clients on where to look for other translators when I couldn't take their order. And then, later, I was referring jobs directly to colleagues that I knew I could trust. Eventually, I got orders that I could handle, but the turnaround time was too short for one person. So I brought on a colleague to split the work and paid this subcontractor out of my own earnings. This led to working with larger teams where I was doing less of the translating and more proofreading. A few years later, I started managing translations for languages I don't know by selecting translators and proofreaders whose credentials looked credible and whose rates I could afford based on what my clients were willing to pay. Now, I'm mostly supervising other translators and managing the flow of new orders from prospect to sale to translation, proofreading, and delivery. This seems to be a common career progression for language service companies, and the point is this. If you're seeking subcontracted translation work from agencies, you're probably going to be working for other translators if it's a small agency, or employees trained and hired by other translators if it's a larger agency. The values and business practices you bring from your other jobs will be useful, but they may need to be adjusted to the norms of the language business. Translation is not a normal job, and translators are not normal people. Our brains are wired differently. I'm going to cover the traits that a translation agency is probably looking for in you as a translator, split into three phases. Number one, how you attract the attention of an agency. Number two, how to negotiate for that first order. Number three, how to perform at this audition so they'll come back to you again and eventually make you their preferred provider. Because agencies want a preferred provider. If you're a good Vietnamese translator, they want you to be their default Vietnamese translator who they can trust every time and not bother sifting through more resumes to start the screening process all over again. So first, standing out from the crowd, how to get their attention. Let's say you're walking downtown in a new city looking for a good restaurant and you're a picky eater with high standards. Some places aren't even going to get a second glance. Maybe you don't like chain restaurants and you're partial to Italian food, so you wouldn't look twice at an olive garden for one reason or at a taco stand for another. You can picture in your mind the kind of restaurant you want to find for lunch and you're walking quickly and scanning both sides of the road hoping to glimpse a place that fits your mental image. The name for this efficient screening practice is heuristics. I'm a translator, so I love words, especially exotic Greek-sounding words like heuristics. Rules of thumb are heuristics. Racial profiling is a negative example of heuristics. Anytime you flip through a magazine, just glancing at each page until something grabs your attention, that's heuristics. If you're running through the park and see two paths with one going past a stranger standing in the bushes and one out in the open by a family playing with their toddler and you choose the latter, that's heuristics. A practical problem-solving method, not guaranteed to be perfect, but good enough for making quick decisions. Our brains are programmed to create and refine heuristics for very practical reasons. We're exposed to a constant fire hose of information, and there's no way to process it unless we can ignore most of it. For this section on first impressions, I want to explain the heuristics that an agency like mine uses to filter out the legitimate translators who are worth our time contacting. It's not a perfect system, and no doubt we overlook some very qualified applicants who just aren't that good at self-promotion, but in the interest of time, it's a system that works. As small as our agency is, we get hundreds of emails a year from freelancers offering their services. It would be nice to be able to write back to each one and get acquainted, but that's one of those items on our to-do list that's far enough down that we don't often reach it. Instead, we leave their email in our inbox, and the next time we get a request for their language pair, we search the inbox by that language and quickly scan everyone's email cover letters. If the cover letter doesn't meet certain minimum requirements, we don't bother opening attachments like a resume. We'd rather hire someone who has contacted us than go out to an online registry like um, the ATA or 
here in Austin, the AATIA, because it shows they're proactive and looking for work if they bothered to send us a cover letter and resume. So, what are we looking for in these emails? In order of priority, they are, number one, correct spelling, grammar, and writing style in American English. Number two, the source language to target language combination we need. Number three, credibility indicators, which is sort of a umbrella term for education, certifications, experience, professional association, memberships, and so forth. Number four, standard rates. If you're desperate for work or experience, put some low rates on there to catch the eye of really cheap clients. If you're established and have worked your way up to the higher tiers, listing these higher rates will help screen out the cheap clients that you don't really want to work for anyway. Number five, your specialized knowledge for certain orders. I have a friend who specializes in translation for the livestock industry, another who does especially uh, interpretation for firefighters. Um, some people have special software skills like MemoQ, Trados, Deja Vu, Adobe InDesign, Microsoft Publisher, HTML. So if you have those skills, uh, put them there on the cover letter and the resume. Phase two. You've caught the attention of the agency and you're ready to negotiate and close that first sale for the first document. Returning to my analogy of looking for a new place to eat lunch, let's say you spot a likely restaurant and scan the menu posted on the window. It looks good, so you walk inside. A friendly host greets you and shows you to a table. You sit and a waiter comes over to answer questions and suggest some specials. This is a stage where the translation agency has gone from receiving your email to deciding you might be just the person to translate an order they have pending. Sometimes they're just adding you to their database for future orders, but the dynamics are similar. Now there's little negotiating that must take place because they're probably doing the same thing simultaneously with other candidates. You'll get the original document that needs to be translated, or a sample, to review and prepare your quote. Whether or not you get hired for that first job is based on, in no particular order, your professionalism, do you show an appropriate level of formality, courtesy, cheerfulness, prompt responses to emails? Do you provide a clear and detailed quote? Your availability and turnaround time for this document. Your exact fee for this document, usually based on the word count, but sometimes also the complexity, formatting, subject matter, and available time. The agency doesn't want a tentative estimate or an hourly rate unless you're dealing with interpretation. And your specialized knowledge, experience, and credentials relating to this type of document. If you look credible from the agency's perspective, then they'll send you an approval to begin the order with any instructions about format, file type, terminology, invoicing, etc. Don't start the job until you have written confirmation from them, usually an email, on how much they're going to pay you and when. Depending on whether you're working for legitimate, well-established agencies or the low end of the market, you may never have payment problems, or you may have a couple people that need reminders and gentle pressure to send you your check. I can think of four or five orders out of thousands that fall into that category, personally. So, phase three. Earning their repeat business. How do you turn them into a happy customer that comes back to you time and time again? I'm going to assume here that your experience with the agency was positive. They treated you fairly and paid you on time. If not, cut your losses and walk away. Because just like you're auditioning for them, they're auditioning for you. So, what are the factors that will determine if this dining experience was positive enough for the restaurant hopper to return next time she's craving Italian food? Just like any purchasing decision, there are objective and subjective influences. As a translation project manager, these are the reasons I choose to use a contractor again for the second or subsequent time. Number one, translation quality. From the simple, was the spelling, the grammar, and the formatting correct, to the more complex, semantic accuracy and stylistics. Number two, keeping deadlines. The translation has to be turned in before the deadline, and if it's a long, extended project, the translator should be giving unsolicited updates on progress to reassure the project manager that everything's on schedule. Number three, reliability and consistency. Every time I hire the subcontractor, do they turn in the same quality of work? No matter what the topic is and how long they have, do they keep their commitment? Number four, following instructions. 
An agency isn't going to waste its time or yours with instructions that don't matter, so they need you to take seriously all instructions that came with the order. It might be terminology, formatting, style, uh, file type. Number five, integrity. This means admitting when you're in over your head rather than trying to fake it. If you can't handle this type of document or if you don't have enough time to do it, say it at the get-go so they can go to somebody else. And number six, invoicing. Do you invoice as instructed? Do you send it promptly? Is it clear, accurate, and complete? Remember, the agency wants you to succeed. We want our contracted translators to turn out great work, and we want to send them more and more. That's how we make a living, too. We rely on them just as much as they rely on us. It's a professional partnership. You might be an excellent German translator for technical documents, but have no experience with medical terminology. If an agency you've contacted asks you to translate a stack of complex oncology reports and you tell them honestly that you're not qualified, it will cost you that order, but it's still a positive interaction. You've left a good impression as someone who understands what you have to offer and won't put the agency in a bind with their client by turning in an acceptable work. You might be an excellent Russian translator able to turn out 2,500 words a day. When contacted by an agency that needs 5,000 words translated by tomorrow, just say no. Unless you can split it up with partners, it would mean turning in a substandard product even if you stayed up all night. Translation is intense cognitive work. As we all know, and a tired brain does it poorly. What's more, an agency trying to get that many words translated that fast by one person is probably not an agency that you want to work with. They should have known to take the job to a team, not an individual. You might be an excellent English to Chinese translator, having been raised and educated in China. But if an agency asks you to translate Chinese to English, be honest about your level of fluency in writing natural, colloquial American English. Maybe you can still be a part of the team, but the final editing needs to be done by someone qualified as a Chinese to English translator. I'll conclude by restating the opening question. What do agencies want in a translator? We want someone who knows how to translate well, on a deadline, at a reasonable rate, but just as importantly, we want someone who understands their own limitations and won't offer more than they can deliver. Thank you.